being angry at God for injustice. You have a, a passion for justice. Uh, why? Is that just your feelings? Is there, no, is there an absolute justification for your passion for justice? Do you have a right to get angry at God? If so, that right comes from God. So that counts for God. Yeah? You talked about how the love for absolute goodness or the hunger for absolute goodness, and I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis's calling it the irrepressible longing. Mm -hmm. But in our society, it seems like there's so many things that cover that, whether it's materialism or hedonism mm -hmm. and so forth. How can we unearth that so people start to see that love and that hunger that they do have innately for absolute well, you can't give what you don't have, so you first have to discover it in your own life. And the thing that is blocking that discovery is noise. Uh, you discover that only in silence. Why do we have so much noise? Why are our lives so complicated? Why does nobody have any time anymore? That's an interesting question. One way that we certainly have progressed more and more every year is technology. We've got more and more technology and it's more efficient. Every single piece of technology is a way of saving time. So we ought to have more leisure, not less. But it's exactly the opposite. We have less. Where did all the time go? Well, why do we keep so busy? Maybe we're afraid of that silence. Maybe we keep chattering because we're afraid to shut up. What would happen if we shut up? We would see one of two things. We would either hear the voice of God or we would hear the sounds of silence. And those are both kind of scary in opposite ways. So I think that accounts for the fact that we're so busy. Jesus said, blessed are the poor. And we usually interpret that as, well, they have a moral right to, to be helped uh, and we should, we should love them. I think that's true, but it's also true that the poor are luckier than the rich because their lives are simpler. So we should strive to be poor. Give away what you don't need. Swap your car for a bike. Um, in the argument for absolute goodness, is it possible to counter argue that uh, that argument is just the summation of all, of all the other good things that we want? Like, which we can never, never attain, we're always just striving for that. If that were so, then the closer you got to that goal, the happier you'd be. But we find exactly the opposite. The one single power that can produce most of the stuff that we want is money. Money can buy everything that money can buy. So if what you said is true, the rich should be significantly happier than the poor. Not so. What's the most spectacular and unanswerable argument for unhappiness? Suicide. The suicide rate is directly proportionate to not poverty, but wealth. I think that's pretty empirical proof. <coughs> yes? He has to do with one spirit. Uh, you are a teacher, uh, you're a writer. Uh, do you mind sharing a little bit with us how your relationship with the Holy Spirit is when you write or when you teach? Well, the Holy Spirit is not, for most of us, an object of our religious experience. In fact, God the Father is always the ultimate object, and Christ the Son is the only way we know the Father, and it's the Spirit who is always working to prod us in that direction. So he's sort of the anonymous person of the Trinity. He, he whispers behind you. But everything that's good is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's always the whole Trinity that's working. They never specialize. So the more you're open to the Spirit, the more you love Jesus and the more you know God. And what the Spirit does in your life is he, he illumines things. He, he, he brings light, for instance, to reading scripture. Uh, he gives you the strength to practice the supernatural virtues. That's not human effort. That's inspired by the Spirit. In fact, he's got a role in everything. He's not just over here. He's everywhere. So the more, the more you open yourself to the Holy Spirit, the more charismatic you become in that biblical sense, the more Christian you'll be, because the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal himself, he reveals Jesus. 
He's transparent to Jesus, just as Jesus is transparent to the Father. So a Christian is as monotheistic and theocentric as, as a Muslim or a Jew, uh, and he's totally Christocentric, and he is, whether he knows it or not, a, a Pentecostal, charismatic. It's not either or. Those are essential dimensions of our faith. <clears throat> okay. Uh, from on the scientific side of these arguments, we're unable to provide both, for example, position and velocity of an electron. Is this sort of debate or dialogue with science going to end up with answering the question with purpose or chance? Is that a no. No, that's a philosophical presupposition. The argument between Einstein and Heisenberg as to whether there's really indeterminacy in nature or that's just our limitation of knowledge is not something that will ever be settled by science because we have the same data interpreted differently by the philosophical realist Einstein who says randomness has to be in our knowledge and not in reality and the, the more skeptical uh, argument of, of, of Bohr. Uh, many questions that scientists can't settle uh, are only answered by philosophers. That's why the argument about creation and evolution is, is so fruitless, because you don't usually have a philosopher mediating it. So it becomes an argument between religion and science, or faith and reason. But it's philosophy that has to mediate that. Uh, my question in two parts. Uh, which argument for God's existence first convinced you, and what continues to convince you? Well, I think the argument for God's existence that convinced me first was my mother. <laughs> her existence and her love. So I never really had serious doubts about God's existence. I had doubts about whether I wanted to go to heaven, because at one point in my life I said, uh, I didn't realize I had ADD at the time, I was just a teenager. I said, I don't like to be bored, and I'm bored in church, and I don't want to be bored forever in heaven, so I don't want to go there. But I don't want to go to hell either, and I can't live here forever, I'm stuck. <laughs> But then I realized eventually that there's no temple in heaven, and heaven is not a church service, it's God himself. And that's the least boring thing. But I, I, I guess if you were to rephrase the question and say, right now, which argument is the most impressive to you? I think it's the argument from desire. Because that's an argument from the deepest part of our heart. If this thing that we long for the most doesn't exist, then life is ultimately a, a meaningless game and, and a frustration. Yeah. You've given us um, arguments from the point of then against atheism, why God doesn't exist, but um, there's a there's book coming out from Harvard, maybe it just, just, just come out this week, um, Good Without God. What's a good argument against agnosticism, just not caring at all whether God exists or not? Um, you can be good without believing in God, but you can't be good without God. Uh, the agnostic who doesn't believe in God, but does believe in goodness, uh, believes in goodness only because God's inspiring him, and whatever good he has does ultimately come from God, he just doesn't know that. Uh, Camus is a good example of that. Here's a an honest, moral atheist who's nevertheless an atheist. And one of his most compelling characters in The Plague is his hero, Dr. Rue, who's a European doctor who's in Algeria, and he's the only European doctor there at the time, and a plague breaks out, and nobody can, can minister to these plague victims because the medicine is so primitive, and he can go back to Europe to a comfortable life, but he doesn't. He stays there and saves thousands of lives and risks his own, like Father Damien in Hawaii. Why does he do that? Well, he, say, he, he reasons it this way. He says, I don't believe in God, uh, but I do believe in being a saint. The meaning of life is to be a saint. The thing I can't figure out is how can you be a saint without God? And he never did figure that out. But at least he knows the meaning of life is to be a saint. Yeah, there are some very saintly atheists. <laughs> 